it's an honor for me to come here. It's a pleasure for me to have a chat, have a conversation with you. And I, I agree with you that the conversation back home and on the rest of the planet is very acrimonious. And I've been saying that it's okay to challenge someone, it's okay to take someone on, it's okay to disagree with someone, but hating them is a choice that we make. And it's not necessary to hate people. And I think the main thing that, as youngsters, you must look at and you must work on is that you're going to meet many people in your life who disagree with you. And they disagree with you because they come from a different place that you come from, a different perspective that you come from, a different set of ideas surround them than surround you. And the starting point, a very good starting point, is to try and look at the world from their perspective. Very often, and when I was your age, my starting point was how I viewed the world. And as far as I was concerned, I understood the world and everybody else didn't quite get it like we did. And then when you, when you work, when you, when you go into details, you find that actually perspectives that you might not agree with are valuable. They exist because of certain circumstances the other person is undergoing. And there is always a conversation possible. And I think that's, that's something that has to be done in the 21st century. We can't, we can't afford to have the type of wars that we had 50, 60, 70 years ago, 100 years ago, because we would basically destroy the planet. So there are certain trajectories that are building up. You can see in the foreign affairs space, you can see the United States, you can see Western Europe, you can see a rising China, and you can see the foundations of a potential conflict. And it's playing out everywhere. If you, if you look carefully, that conflict is already operating. And I think India, with our nonviolent ideas, with our complexity, with our ability to show compassion to people we don't agree with, which is embedded in our culture, in our history, I think we have a role to play. And I said today at one of my earlier lectures, somebody asked me, you know, is India on this side or on that side? And I said, no, India's much too big, much too intelligent, much too refined to be either on this side or on that side. India has a vision of its own for the world. And we are going to certainly work with others, but we also have a perspective which is important. So I'd, I'd like to end there, and I'm happy to listen to your comments and your questions. So uh, thank you, Mr. Gandhi. I think what we are going to do is I'll, I'll put out a few questions to start with to get us growing, and then we'll open it up uh, to Q&A. So the first thing I wanted to say, really not on my behalf, but on behalf of, of I know many people here, uh, your critics, uh, there is a held view that you've had a very long probation uh, in politics. Uh, you've taken your time and you have finally taken, uh, been elected uh, president of the Indian National Congress. Um, what do you bring to the job along with the family name? I think a couple of things. One is that I've been through a certain degree of violence. I've seen uh, violence up close. I've had family members killed. And I understand how violence works and why violence is destructive. And it's a small thing to say, but I think those experiences have made me a compassionate person, a person who understands that violence hurts people. So I, I have a tendency to reach out and listen. And I think that's, in my work, it's a very useful thing. It helps one build coalitions. It helps one listen. It helps one actually move things forward. 
So that's one, one thing I certainly think. The other thing is that, frankly, 15 years in politics is a serious amount of experience. And I've taken my, my you know, the share of, share of uh, shots to the chin, I've taken that, and I've understood how to deal with it. I've, I've borne the brunt of massive attacks, and I think I've learned a lot from them. The final thing is, I love my country. And I have, uh, I love my country and I feel deeply for people in my country who are weak, who are bullied, who are beaten up. I feel deeply, for example, for people from the lower castes, tribal communities, farmers, women who are in a, in a difficult situation and I, I really want to help them. And I think that there is, a, there is a genuineness that, that I feel. So let's take three areas. Social justice, which you've already begun to talk about, secularism, and economic policy. What, what is your vision for these? What are your policy recommendations? What is your vision for India on these three things? I mean, first of all, we like to divide these things as if they come in nice buckets, you know, economics, sociology, politics, it doesn't work like that. I, I like to view it much more in terms of the processes that are taking place. And what I see is a transformation of 1.3 billion people. A transformation that started over 100 years ago, uh, a modernizing impulse in India, a impulse to reach out to the world, an impulse to leave the Indian village to break the shackles of caste. And so I, I view my job is working with that impulse and helping that impulse uh, expand further and reach out further. I'm also the type of person who understands that my view or what I think is not what should drive the future of 1.3 billion people. My view is my view, and yes, I have certain opinions, but really what is interesting to me is what is the view of the Indian farmer? He understands agriculture much better than I do. Who am I to tell him that this is my vision for you? My job is to go to him and say, what do you need? How can we help you? What is your vision for agriculture? How would you like to help uh, empower your country? How would you like to ensure that the food you are you're growing, the, the rice you're growing or the wheat you're growing reaches, you know, these young, young kids. And the surprising thing to me is, which, is, which is something that I find people underestimate, you can go to people and you might think, oh, you know, they're not educated, they don't have a good experience, they don't understand the world. You're wrong. I have met many, many policy experts on agriculture. And I can tell you, your average farmer sitting in an Indian farm will take on that person and teach him about agriculture. So to me, it's much more about reaching out to students. That's why I have a conversation with you. Sometimes you get into a situation where you ask us some difficult questions. OK, big deal, no problem. <laughs> no, it happens. It happens. No problem. We'll deal with it. Uh, and I, I like to reach out to communities and, and ask them what do you want to do and how can we organize everybody right how can we how can we make how can we negotiate something between the farmers and the workers who work on their farms and the people who sell the the products well, what does that compromise look like so that's how i think about it if you were to ask me what is my vision personal vision on <coughs> economics for example i would say the central problem we are faced with and frankly the united states is faced with it western europe is faced with it we are unable to produce the number of jobs we need. We have released hundreds of millions of youngsters from our villages, and they've come to the cities, and they're saying to us, guys, we need jobs. And the Indian state is saying to them, sorry, we're not going to give you jobs. We actually can't give you jobs, so we're going to have a conversation about irrelevant stuff. We're going to have a conversation about you know, how we can... Uh, divide the nation. Now we're going to have a conversation about 
you know, what this cricketer looks like, or we're going to have a conversation about what this actress says. The thing to understand is, youngsters, there's a crisis in India. There's a full-blown crisis in India, and it's called the job crisis. And the Indian state and the Indian government is not accepting it. It is simply saying it doesn't exist. And I'll give you a little bit of an idea. 50,000 jobs 20, every 24 hours in China. 450, 450 jobs in 24 hours in India. That's a catastrophe. Okay, so how are you gonna, how are you gonna develop these jobs? These jobs are gonna come from a couple of places. They're gonna come from small and medium businesses. They're gonna come from revitalizing, re-energizing agriculture, connecting the farm to the table or to your uh, dining rooms. They're gonna come from infrastructure, construction of low-cost houses. That's where they're gonna come from. But you have to organize people to say, okay, the first thing you gotta do is you gotta to explain to people there's a problem. In, in the 60s and 70s, there was a problem in India. It was called food security. And India said, okay, there is a problem, we gotta solve it. And then the attention of India moved to solving that problem, and then it got solved. And I'm very confident that this, this job problem can be solved. But India has to first accept that there is a problem. On, on stuff like sort of social justice, I think pushing democracy further, protecting our institutions, making sure that people's voice guides institutions, making sure that women can come into all our institutions. Those are the type of things that I would push forward. Uh, but again, I'm much more interested, frankly, in what the stakeholders of India are interested in. And I see myself, you use the word enabler, uh, service provider. I, I view government as enablers. India has a tremendous amount of energy. Our job is to put that energy together and make it productive. Sorry, that was long. Uh, no, that's fine. <laughs> On agriculture, can I, I mean, the UPA government commissioned and got the MS Swaminathan report, right, in January 2007. Would you implement it? I mean, that was listening to the farmers. It's there on the table. It's available. The farmers want it. There are, there are, a, couple, there are a couple things about the agricultural sector. One, pretty much anybody will tell you that your average Indian farmer simply doesn't make enough money to survive. Yeah. So there is a, there is a economic problem in the Indian farm. And that problem requires two or three things. It requires support. So it requires, in the crudest terms, it requires MSP. It requires a minimum support price. It requires a sensitive touch when there's a flood or when it rains too little or when there's a hailstorm, the government reaches out and says, listen, we're gonna protect you. Uh, it requires sometimes farm loan waiver when you have uh, Drought after drought, your, your farmers are in debt, debt, you might need to help them out. So there is, there is a support element that is very important. And then there is also a productivity element that is important. How do we change habits? How do we inject technology into the farm? And yes, a lot of these things are in the, in the report. And I think it would be our endeavor to support the farmer as much as possible. See, at the end of it, it's a very simple thing. If you go to the Indian farmer today and say, listen, do you feel supported by the Indian government? The answer is no. Hindi mein niyat ki baat hoti hai. Agar niyat saaf hoti hai, wo samaj jata hai. Sorry, do Hindi. Agar niyat saaf hoti hai, to samaj jata hai. If the, if the intention is right, if the feeling is right, the person understands. So a lot of, a lot of politics is about that. Do you actually believe that Indian agri agriculture is something that supports India, builds India, projects Indian power? Or do you believe that Indian agriculture is a drain? The current government believes that Indian agriculture can be replaced. When you speak to them, their conversation is, well, you know what, if, we, if our farmer can't grow the wheat, 
We can buy the wheat from elsewhere. But that's not only the only role of the Indian farmer. The Indian farmer is integrated in our society. He does much more than grow, just grow wheat. He is a deep element of our society. And it's our duty to help him and protect him. Thank you. Um, you didn't talk about secularism, but I'm sure it'll come up in, in questions uh, later. I can if you want. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. You're the boss. Uh, what would you like me to say about that? Uh, well, your vision on, on that issue. Uh, and it is you know, important. Again, there are, there are two big transitions of massive scale taking place on this planet. There's the movement of Chinese people from their villages into their urban areas and the transformation of the Chinese system, and then there's the transformation of the Indian system. And it's been done in two completely different ways. So they've organized it, they've got a central control, they have the Communist Party, we have a less organized, more chaotic, more organic, or organic structure. But the important thing to understand from the Indian perspective is that whatever we've achieved so far, has been achieved on the back of all of India's people. It hasn't been done by a few people. The whole of India has sacrificed to get us where we have arrived. And so to me, it goes without saying that if the whole of India has sacrificed to bring us where we are, the whole of India has to benefit from what we have become. And you cannot now say that, sorry, uh, we are not going to give benefits from this great transformation to tribals. We are going to exclude minorities. We are going to exclude Dalits. We are going to exclude farmers. And oh, by the way, we'll also exclude women. You can't do that. So India is 1.3 billion different perspectives. Uh, every Indian person has a particular view. And I respect every single one of them. So, the term secularism encompasses only the religious aspect. I say that there shouldn't be a single Indian person, regardless of religion, caste, community, state, gender, anything, anything, who should not feel that my voice is not heard in this country and who should not feel that, you know what? We've come so far. And everybody agrees. President Obama says that you know, the real challenge to the United States is coming from India and China. So we have been successful. So I don't feel anybody in India should say, I am not getting a part of what I have built. Mm. Okay. Thank you. That's, that gives us some clarity of your personal vision, where you stand on these issues. Let's talk about the Congress party. Right? So uh, if we were to do a SWOT analysis, yeah? strength, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, to translate this vision on the ground, communicate it, deal with the opposition as it stands, which is a very well-oiled, hard-working machinery in India. How does the Congress, how, what is your assessment as president of your political party on these four? Would you say, would, are you talking uh, in the short term or are you talking in a, on a grander, longer term perspective? Well, I, I know most of this audience is thinking about the next eight next months election. in particular. Next, but... next election is going to be pretty straightforward. Next election is going to be a BJP on one side and the entire opposition on the other side. That is what the next election is going to be. And the reason, the reason for that is that almost everybody in the opposition and also members of the BJP alliance feel that the encroachment that is taking place on Indian institutions the systematic attack that is taking place on Indian institutions. You saw four, four uh, justices of the Supreme Court come out and say we're not allowed to do our work. Um, you saw recently a journalist uh, who was sacked because he, he did a program in, about farmers in Chhattisgarh. So there is a feeling in the opposition that for the first time, a organization is challenging the very conception of India. And this has not happened in the last 70 years before. And so there is this mood that we need to defend the Indian institutions. We need to defend the idea of one man, one vote. We need to defend the sort of 
inclusive idea of India. And so you're going to have a clear-cut election where pretty much everybody is going to be on this side and the RSS, PJP is going to be on the other side. And once that math starts to come into play, and you can, you can look at the UP and Bihar alliances as a sort of central focus area, it becomes very difficult for the BJP to win an election. Does the now, if you want me to tell you about the Congress. the Congress, I can. Organization. Yeah. The, the Congress is, a, is an idea that is actually very old. It is not a new idea in India. Uh, similar to the RSS, which is also a very old idea in India. And these ideas, if you read Indian philosophy, if you read our history, these ideas have been in combat for thousands of years. There are different visions on how to organize society. The RSS vision of how to organize a society is a top to bottom hierarchy where knowledge is centralized. And the Congress vision of organizing India is a decentralized structure where knowledge is available with everybody and you try to reduce the hierarchy. That's the basic fight. So the Congress has this idea embedded very deep inside it. When you talk to Congress workers, when you talk to Congress leaders, and you scratch the surface, you find this idea. You find non-violence inside them. They struggle in the environment. They struggle to bring it out because the environment is aggressive. And there's a lot of pushback. But that idea is deep inside Congress workers, Congress leaders. So that's a huge strength. Weakness is that the Congress is not able to express that idea effectively to people. So when people outside the Congress look at the Congress, they struggle to see that idea clearly. See, when you look at the BJP, or even I look at the BJP and the RSS, it's very clear what they're saying. It, there's no confusion. And that's because they've, they, the RSS has spent a certain amount of time working on that idea. Gandhiji used to do that for us. The, the big leaders of the freedom struggle used to do that for us. And that's where the Congress party has not sort of kept pace. But the good news is that the idea is in the Congress. And the idea is in many, 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 many Indians. See, and, and the idea manifests. So for example, when you see a strong person beating up a small person, a weak person, a woman on the street. Something comes out inside you. You feel, you feel this sense of protection. You feel, I want to do something about this. That's the Congress. That is the idea of the Congress. And you will feel it in you. So the weakness of the organization is that it is not able to reach out to you and say, actually, that idea that you're feeling, that's us. And the second thing is that the Congress has, over time, closed itself. And the Congress needs to start opening itself. It needs to start saying, OK, you guys need to come in. You guys need to help us run this system. You guys need to work with us. So the, the Congress needs to expand out, and the Congress needs to be precise about what it actually stands for. So that's strengths, weaknesses. Great. And opportunities. Um, Opportunity to me is bringing in millions and millions of Indian youngsters who deeply buy the Congress idea and delivering them an organization that really can work with them, can empower them to transform India. Threat in the Congress, arrogance. How are you going to bring these millions of young? Are you going to have membership drives? Is eight months enough? Or is this a longer term 
I mean, is this something that has to be done patiently and There's quietly? A, you see, these are transitions. And there is a there is a past, there are senior leaders with experience, with understanding, and then there are a lot of youngsters who are developing. You can't break the past, because there is a lot of value in some of the senior people. So you have to, in a sense, the pre present has to be a merger of the future and the past. And that's, that's really why the Congress ran, ran into trouble in 2014, because we found that there was a there was a internal fight taking place between the older generation and the younger generation and a lot of the work that we've done now is to try and bring them together successfully so you can see for example uh, in a rajasthan a sachin pilot working with mr ashok gelot or you can see um, in madhya pradesh or in maharashtra you can see these the this taking shape but see i don't I don't view the Congress as purely an organization. To me, the Congress is, it's, it's yours. Gandhiji used to use the word trusteeship. I like that word. This is your organization. And the tragedy is that you can't, easily come into this organization. And I spend a lot of my time, and I, I, I get a lot of beating for it, pain for it, in trying to bridge this, this gap. But realize that this is your instrument. It is the most powerful instrument. Today I went to the Houses of Parliament. And you know, in one of the speeches, the gentleman said, it, it, it hit me, I hadn't really thought of it like that. The, the gentleman said, you know, this is the room in the British Parliament from where India used to be run. I frankly was speechless, I, I'd never conceptualized that. That my country could be run from a room in another country. How, how can that be? But that's the reality. And the organization and the idea that fought the superpower and beat them and allowed me today to go to that room and say, actually, it's quite interesting that there are 10, 12 Indian MPs who are helping run Britain from the very same room. <laughs> I mean, with no, with, no disrespect, with no disrespect, this is a magical thing, right? And by the way, I didn't say, you know, there was no acrimony. I fully accepted that there is a relationship between the British and us. I fully accepted that I'm speaking to youngsters here today who are studying in the LSE. And I'm speaking to them in English. This is not our language. This is the language of the British. So when you draw boundaries and you say this is us and that's them, it doesn't work. It, it's convenient when you want to beat up somebody or when you want something, but it doesn't work. And that's how I want you to think. I want you to, I want you to realize that this institution took on a superpower and defeated it. And this is your institution and my job is frankly to hand this thing to you, to open the space for you so that you can use this instrument to transform our great country. On a completely different note, can I uh, ask you what you had for dinner at Subway last night? This is... <laughs> no, I didn't. That was, that was Milen. We were... What People actually... are very worried that you had a Subway sandwich. No, no, no. Just I, tell us I, I didn't, didn't. I didn't actually... I had a nightmare flight last night. I mean, you have no idea what I mean, but we went through. Uh, I think the flight, we had these talks, and then the flight was, uh, what, 10.30, Milind? It was 10.30, they told us 10.45, 11, 11.30, 12, 12.30, 1, 1.32, 2.33, 3.30, it just went on and on and on. 
We arrived at the hotel room at, what, five, five o'clock this morning, and then we were off again at nine o'clock. So we had a bad time, and we didn't, we didn't uh, eat much last night. Good. That lays to rest a lot of concerns that have been expressed. I'm good. Um, can I ask you a very serious question now about uh, 1984? We've heard Prime Minister Manmohan Singh's statement. We know this. Can I take this opportunity, Rahul Gandhi, to ask you how you feel about the riots, the anti I think riots? I think when Mr. Manmohan Singh spoke, he spoke for all of us. And as I said earlier, I'm a victim of violence, and I understand what it feels like. So I am against any sort of violence against anybody. Even uh, anybody on this planet, I am against violence. Even I, I get disturbed when I see uh, anybody being hurt. So I condemn that 100%, and I am 100% for punishment of people who are involved in any violence against anybody. And that's crystal clear. There's no, uh, that's what it is. Okay, I saw, you know, people who haven't had violence done to them think that violence is what you see in movies. That's not what it is. I've seen people who I loved very much being killed. I've also seen the person who killed my father being killed. And I can say that when I saw Mr. Prabhakaran lying, on the beaches in Jaffna. And when I saw him being humiliated the way he was being humiliated, because that's what was happening, I felt sorry for him because I saw my father in his place. And I saw, felt sorry for him because I saw his children in my place. So when you've been hit by violence, and when you understand it, it has a completely different impact on you. Most people don't actually understand violence. Your, your average person doesn't understand violence. It's a horrible thing. It's an absolutely horrible thing, and I don't wish it on anybody. And I think the critical thing that people will want to know is that your personal vision, which is very important and you've been very good at explaining it, then becomes part of how Congress manages it on the streets, in riots, where it stands on the communal question, where it has been complicit in the past. It doesn't have a very you know, spotless record. And that's what basically, if, you're, if I'm reading you correct, you're saying under your trusteeship, your stewardship of the Congress, you cannot be president of a political party that will be party to that kind of violence? I, I mean, no question. Absolutely not. I mean, uh, there's, no, there's no question at all. Because the, the essence of my party, the essence of our uh, ideology is nonviolence. Final question for me, 2019, because I know, again, it's on everyone's minds. Do you have, have you thought through a criteria of how a candidate for the prime minister's job will be chosen in this uh, coalition that you described earlier? If the Congress doesn't win a majority, and if it does, are there criteria? Have you, have you given it some thought? What we are defending is the onslaught on the Indian Constitution, what we see as an onslaught on the Indian Constitution and Indian institutions. And me and the entire opposition 
sees it as defending the nature of the Indian state. So we have agreed that our first priority is to defeat the BJP and stop this in encroachment on the institutional space of India. Stop the poison that is being spread. Stop the division that is taking place. Once the election is over, all those conversations can be had. But we are not going to have those conversations until we have done the first stage, which is to remove the BJP from power. That is the, the nature of the conversation. Okay. And you're going to agree to a common minimum program? We are, we are actually constructing a manifesto within the Congress at the state level and at the national level where we are looking into a lot of the ideas we discussed, um, meeting many people, talking to stakeholders, farmers, others. We are also talking to the allies on what that framework would look like. So potentially we would have a structure that we go to the Indian people with, a common minimum uh, structure. And the other thing is that there are some parties that are not now aligned with the BJP. They were earlier aligned with the BJP, and they're not now aligned with the BJP. Uh, and that's another thing I want to make clear. I see this as an ideological battle. So we're not going to make alliances with anybody who is ideologically not on our platform. We will work with people who are ideologically on our platform, but we will not work with somebody who's not ideologically on our platform. Okay. So, okay. Now, thank you very much for, for that. And I'll uh, take questions from the floor. Uh, the, it will be uh, only students who can ask questions. Stewards will come to you with a microphone. So please introduce yourself and your university. Uh, please keep your questions brief. And let's conduct this in a civilized fashion. Uh, so let's start with the lady at the back in glasses, third row from the back. Please, thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Lavina Joshi, and I study at University of Warwick. My question is, why agricultural sector? Why so much of focus on agricultural sector when India has so many skilled resources to focus upon? Why not bring technology? Why not bring industries at this moment? Great, thank, thank you. So, uh, let me quickly answer. Okay. The, you're not saying that you're going to exclude industry uh, or exclude technology. You're saying that one has to take into, uh, take into consideration the entire Indian structure and move the system forward. So it's not an either or. You can do all three things. That's the first point. Second point is, when you actually look at it in depth, you can't make these type of segregations. Agriculture is deeply linked to many other things in the country. And weak agriculture has an impact on things way beyond the farm. It has an impact on the price of the food you eat. It has an impact on uh, the diseases you get. So the vision that you know we can separate these things and say, OK, this is technology, uh, this is industry, this is agriculture, that's uh, not precise. Second thing is, small example, the fastest growth in India. And some economists came to me shocked. The fastest growth in India came in the rural areas. In the UPA period, when you're growing at 9%, the growth was in the rural areas. And the growth was in the rural areas because Manrega, which is the guaranteed employment scheme, and the farmer loan waiver fired off the economy in the rural areas. And when the economy in the rural areas fired off, whole sets of people started selling stuff to them and started to make money. So it triggered off the entire, it fired off the entire economy. So you have to view it in a connected way. It's like me telling you, you know, uh, why do you do liberal arts? What's the point of studying philosophy? What's the point of studying biology? The whole thing comes together 
When you add all the things together, the value is much more. And that's why we focus on all areas. We focus especially on agriculture because it is struggling and it's weak. Thank you, Mr. Gandhi. My name is Tom Wilkinson. I'm a PhD student here at the LSC. And I wanted to ask you. Um, Do you mind standing up, Tom? Oh, yeah, of so course, yeah. yeah. Can I have a walk around a bit? Yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> hello, hello there. <laughs> um, do we have a hand mic? A spare microphone? So, yeah, my question is as somebody who is from a great political family and now finds himself in the position that you find yourself leading the Indian National Congress. How do you understand uh, dynastic politics in India? How do you make sense of, of uh, dynastic politics in India? And could you answer specifically with regards to your vice to the top? And my second question no, is... No, you're not allowed a second question. Okay, no Thank second you. question. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Thank I you. From, uh, from a particular family. That certainly helps people identify you and helps you enter the political system. But then I'm an elected person. I have fought three elections, uh, democratically elected. Uh, so the term dynasty is not precise because I'm, I'm actually elected. Thank you. Yeah, so the. I think the, the important thing is that I operate in a democracy and I work with people, I get attacked by the opposition, I take the punches, I learn, I react, and I think, I think if you listen to me, uh, you will get a sense that I have thought about some of these things in detail and that I have learned quite a lot. Uh, from my experience over the last 15 years about the type of things that need to be done uh, in our country. So I think the most important thing is what you actually bring to the table, how you listen, how you think about things, and that's a judgment that you have to make after listening to me. There's a question here. Good evening, Rahuji. My name is Moman Sethi and I do politics and economics at the LSE. Across India, we see... Do you study politics or do you do politics? <laughs> well, I do a bit of politics as well, let's just okay. say that. Um, across India, we see growing intolerance, okay? Uh, we see actresses getting threatened to have their nose chopped off. We see four million people from the minority becoming stateless overnight, okay? My question to you is, do you think all those years ago, Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah was correct to stress a nation for the minority to get away from the tyranny of the majority? I don't think so. I think, in fact, India has proved exactly the opposite. Uh, if you look at our history over the last 70 years, we've had more Muslim people than Pakistan, and frankly, We've had a more democratic country, a more open country, a, more, a country that listens and embraces its people more effectively. So I don't agree with that. However, I, I also say that I can understand why Pakistan is struggling. And I can understand some of the issues that they're dealing with. But the negotiation that India has been able to carry out between its people has been much more effective than the one Pakistan has been able to do. So that's something we're very proud of. However, over the last four years, an attack is taking place on Indian institutions. But there is a massive fight back against that attack. And I'm telling you in this room, that the idea of India, the original idea of India, is going to win, 100%, without a doubt. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I sit down again. <laughs> it, sorry, I know it's, it's sort of. It's, uh, <laughs> but you can't stretch your legs. Sorry. No, no. Maybe I, you can. I didn't realize that. I'm sorry. You can 
walk when they're asking the question and sit down. Okay, I can walk while they're asking the question. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dhruva Mathur from the LSC. My question to you is that in a lot of democracies, uh, independent regulators such as the Election Commission, the Central Bank Governor, they're all appointed by the Parliament. In fact, LK Advaniji in 2012 has suggested a similar system for India for the Chief Election Commissioner. What is your party's stand on this? And would you consider having it as part of your 2019 agenda? Thank you. So, coming, sir. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. See, what is happening? Have you noticed? Have you noticed the level of debate in the Indian Parliament? Are you proud of it? You can answer. You can answer. Don't don't feel shy. How many of you in this room are proud of the debate in the Indian Parliament? You see. Now, why why is the debate in the Indian Parliament of so, such low quality? Why do you think you have? Hundreds of experienced politicians, very capable people, and then you look at the parliament and the level of debate, the level of conversation isn't what you expect. There's a lot of shouting. And then notice another thing. If you looked at the same parliament in the 50s, and you read the quality of the debate in the 50s and the 60s, you, you look and you say, my God, what's going on? What has happened? So why this puzzle? What do you think? Anybody? No, no, no. That's... No, 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 no. The real reason is that today members of parliament do not have power. They do not have power to make laws. Today laws are made by the prime minister's office, by the ministers, and by a set of bureaucrats. So it means that our constitution is No, it means that we need to make our members of parliament actually powerful. We need to actually turn around... We need to actually turn around and say, the fact that you're sitting in this house means that you will have lawmaking power. The moment you give them lawmaking power, you will see the quality of the debate will climb immediately. I had a, I'll give you an interesting anecdote. One day, I was talking to one of the members of parliament from Rajasthan. And he said, you know, I made a huge mistake. So I said, why? What, what happened? He said, you know, many years ago, in the late 60s, I was a district magistrate. I was a bureaucrat. And every day, a member of parliament or an MLA would come to my room. And when they'd come, I'd stand up. Because the member of parliament was, had power. So he said, I thought, you know what I thought? I'll resign my job as a bureaucrat and I'll become a member of parliament. So he says, he resigned his job as a bureaucrat, became a member of parliament. And he says, to my horror, when I became a member of parliament and I went to the bureaucrat, to the, to the DM's office, the guy refused to get up now. <laughs> so, if I, if I take this room and I say to you that what you say is going to be translated into policy, for example. You will have a solid debate on it. If I say to you, listen, have whatever debate you want. You're not going to be the people who are going to translate it into policy. The bureaucrats sitting in that room and the prime minister's office and the chief minister's offices are going to decide that. You will, after some time, say, what's the point here? And that's actually what has happened to the Indian Parliament. The member, I spend a huge amount of time doing the job of a Pradhan. I, I'm involved in building, helping conceptualize 
roads in my constituency. But the actual job of a member of parliament is to make laws. And Indian members of parliament today are not, are not involved, actively involved in the process of lawmaking. That's why you don't see a discussion. So coming back to your, your point, you can do what you said, but it means nothing unless you empower the MPs and the MLAs sitting inside the Houses of Parliament and the Houses of Legislative Assembly. So that's really the challenge. Okay. Um, your team says, Milan says five minutes. Uh, in which we can case, take a couple more questions. So can I take two together, yeah, 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 please? please? And uh, the lady here first, and then the gentleman at the back. Can I just say that I have no idea, I can't tell your faces from here. If I pick LSE students over others, it's entirely coincidental. <laughs> so please, I, I have no idea. Please, uh, go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Rahul. My name is Nusrat Lashkar, and I'm a management student at LSE. <laughs> <laughs> student at LSE. My question to you today is, if you are given a chance to become the Prime Minister of India, what will be your plans in terms of empowering the youth? Empowering women? Empowering the youth. The youth? Yeah. OK, let's take another question at the back. You Good evening, Mr. Answer. Gandhi. Uh, my name is Sairam Natarajan, and in the spirit of full transparency, I'm not a student, uh, but I am so from Nisau. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm from Nisau, sorry. Um, very quick question. What is your take on um, transparency in political funding? And if you believe that there should be something about that, what I would you do if you come to power? On that, the more transparency, the better. OK. Thank you. Do you oppose Thank electoral you. bonds? I mean, the way they're designed currently. They're completely uh, opaque. Yeah. So, yeah. so electoral bonds today are basically designed to uh, hide sources yeah. 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 And, and attack opposition. While we are at it. Sorry, should, do you want me to just? Uh, yeah, uh, the lady here, empowering the youth. Empowering youngsters. Um, the instrument to empower youngsters is the political system. And there's simply not enough talented, capable youngsters in the political system. And I think that's where a lot of work needs to be done, and that's where I spend a lot of my energy working. And if you're interested in uh, working in that area, we would happily, happily recruit you and get you to do some work. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I think. Milin, we are going to have a lot of very, very disappointed students, so please maybe have another five minutes. Yeah, yeah okay. we'll do. We'll, Thank we'll do. Can we do that, please? Okay, so uh, let me see. Let's take just next to you on the left. Hi, my name's Rohan Sankla. Um, I'm a student at LSE as well. <laughs> there's there's definitely a bias going on here. <laughs> I, don't, I don't recognize these guys. Okay, and then I must say, the no, I can still ask my question. Okay, yeah, yeah that's Can fair. I finish my question, no. though? That's fair, that's fair. Let's not stop Rohan mid-sentence. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Quickly, um, though. Yeah, my question uh, is um, related to the first question Dr. Banerjee asked, uh, which is to do with your own personal experiences. And it also connects to you saying that you want to be an interpreter and an enabler. I want to ask, um, in your journey when you've been listening and translating the visions of common Indian citizens, farmers, as you've said so many times. Have you ever been wrong in your judgment? We are, we are often wrong. I mean, the, you, you learn. You don't, you don't learn by being right. You learn by being wrong. Because if you're right, you just keep doing it. So I think absolutely I've been wrong many, many times. Can you give an example? <laughs> you're a student. You need to learn. Uh, <laughs> Example, what, I mean, in what, in what area? Just in policy or? But you read provision. I'll, I'll give you an example. I thought, I used to think that simply improving the economic posi position of a person, simply transforming India economically will result in a reduction of caste thinking. I don't hold that view anymore. Uh, it won't. Uh, and I can, give you, I can give you multiple examples. Multiple. See, whenever, 
whenever you look at something in depth and you actually study it, you will find that your viewpoint has certain, you're making certain mistakes. And so the, it's a process of saying, okay, does that work? Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Okay, then what works? So it's a constant process that you're, you're, you're doing. And if you are taking away, or if I take away the fact that I can never be wrong, then basically what I'm saying is that I'm not human. Right? Because it is human to be wrong. So absolutely we do that all the time. I'm sure. Do you do, you do that? Oh, yeah. I'm wrong too often. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's take two final questions. We'll take... Uh, I'll this. tell you another thing. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. I'll tell you another very strong example. Uh, that, that taught me about violence. One gentleman came to see me. Uh, and he sat down, he, he sat down in, in my room and we started to talk and then after some time he said to me, you know, Mr. Gandhi, I can't believe I'm sitting here. So I said, why? He said, because he was a MLA from Punjab. He says, because 25 years ago, I would have killed you. But today I'm sitting here talking to you. He was a in Punjab, he was involved in militancy. And I realized that day that the power of a conversation. Most times you hate somebody. And most times somebody hates you, they're misunderstanding you. And if you go deep enough, you'll find that. There is, there is people are genuinely nice. That's what I believe. I don't believe people are evil. Right? And so, so the, the extent of it sometimes surprises me. How much power a conversation actually has in, in turning a perspective. Okay, final question, I think. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Mr. Gandhi. <clears throat> Over here. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Ranjit Rathor, and I'm the president at Brunel Students Union. So I became the first international student to ever become the president of, uh, of Brunel Students Union. Brunel. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. And, so you're not a politician then. Uh, am I? <laughs> uh, and uh, a couple of months ago, I was the youngest Indian to win the uh, uh, Bharat Gaurav Award. <laughs> wow. That is my introduction. And my question is, uh, since you talked about Rajasthan a lot, uh, I come from Rajasthan, and my question is, uh, uh, in a couple of months' time, uh, there is election in Rajasthan. So what is uh, Congress Party's strategy, uh, vision moving forward for Rajasthan? Thank oh, you. You'll have, to, you'll have to ask that to Sachin and Mr. Ashok Elo for the details. <laughs> but there are some interesting ideas that we had done, carried out in Rajasthan, on health care, uh, when we were in government, on providing uh, free medicines, and constructing a, a healthcare system that is that effectively reaches poor people. So that's something that uh, we are looking at in a comprehensive way. Um, and I think that's something that is interesting for the whole country. And I think India, healthcare is something that can be the next revolution in India. Uh, we're, also, we're also looking at small and medium industries in Rajasthan and how we can empower them and start to create jobs. There is now that corridor that is being constructed. So we are, we are thinking along uh, supporting small and medium industries, developing the healthcare system, making it slightly easier for the young urban uh, Rajasthani from a healthcare perspective, from an education perspective. There's a student there, his arm's gonna fall off if I don't. So, 
Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe this is why when you ask students, the concerns are different. Maybe they, they want to ask about other things. No, I can so, answer that if you want. If you like, I can answer that. No problem. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I answer everybody. I don't hide. I'm not... I don't hide. <laughs> I'm not scared. No, tomorrow, uh, you get a question. chance tomorrow. The, not the today. single biggest instrument against corruption is the right to information. The right to information is like a, a, a arrow that goes right into the heart of the Indian uh, bureaucratic machine, bureaucratic political machine. And that's something that we developed. And unfortunately, that's something that has been weakened and destroyed. It's interesting that it took three years for the Lokpal to be put in place. That's also an inst institution that we conceptualized uh, and we put in place. The third really powerful thing you can do to fight corruption is decentralization. And the idea of Panchayati Raj, the idea of bringing governance closer to people, that's a very powerful thing. Finally, the real question for me, and I'd like to stand up while I'm talking about it, but I don't have the mic. <laughs> but the real question to me that is in my mind is the question of Raphael. And that's a really interesting question because HL has been building aircraft for 70 years. HL has built the MiG 21, 23, 27, 29, the Sukhoi, the Jaguar, the Hawk, whole set of planes. HL has no debt. <coughs> HL has by far the best experience in building aircraft in over 70 years. Our government signed a contract with the SALT and gave the contract to HL. The price we were paying was approximately 520 crores a plane. Then something happened. Prime Minister Modi went to France, changed the contract from 126 planes to 36 planes, changed the pricing structure from 520 crores to 1600 crores, and magically, Mr. Anil Ambani was given the contract. Mr. Anil Ambani is 45,000 crores in debt, Mr. Anil Ambani has never made a plane in his life. And the company that got the contract, the biggest defense contract, one of the biggest defense contracts in the world was formed, wait for this one, one week before the contract was signed. Now to me, this is absolutely amazing. And the absolutely amazing thing about this is that the media in India just won't pick it up. They will not pick it up. So that's an interesting question about corruption. Okay. Uh, I, I think we're, we're, we're running into it. Okay, we'll take the students. Being, you're not an LSE student, are you? Oh, good. Then, we, then I'll let you ask. A, he is only. A, he, you're a student. Yes, I'm a student. I'm Where a student. are you a student? Kings. 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 Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Gandhi. Uh, I'm Shorya Vic. In London or in Cambridge? London. London. Yeah, yeah. They're across the road. Yeah. So uh, I'm the vice president at King's College London Students' Union, and I'm also the first uh, Indian international to be in this, oh, in this position. So my question to you was, we know that Congress doesn't uh, agree to a lot of policies and initiatives of BGP. But are there any initiatives, policies, or ideologies to which the Congress agrees to that belong to the I, BJP? I, I sent a message to the Prime Minister saying that the day he wants to sign the Women's Reservation Bill into law, every single Congress member of Parliament will support it without condition. He also told the Prime Minister, when the discussion about GST was on, that we are happy to cooperate with you on developing 
a GST that works. And the response we got, frankly, was, we're not interested. So they developed a GST that had five tiers, and frankly has been very destructive for India. Because it has made the life of small and medium businesses, shopkeepers, extremely complicated. And between GST and demonetization, we are looking at two GDP points, percentage points knocked up. So we reach out. Um, Unfortunately, sometimes we don't get the response that we'd like. However, on many things, uh, there's a straight line between us. On the way they treat weaker sections, on the way they treat farmers, there's, there's just, it's black and white. But wherever we see that there is an agreement, women's reservation, uh, the idea of GST, we, we're, we're there to support. That, no, sorry, you can't have it. Uh, there's a lady here who's, are you a student of LSE? Okay. And you're going to ask the final question, yeah. How long do you think it will be before we see a female prime minister in India again? I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a soothsayer, uh, but but I think uh, I think India should see many more women leaders at every level uh, in the states. I think it's and it's something that it's something I believe passionately in, and uh, it is something that if you watch the Congress Party over the next couple of years, you will start to see some of the women that we are developing, we are, we are, we are helping them along, you'll start to see them uh, rise to prominence. I unfortunately have to go, but, but it's, been a, it's been a pleasure and it's been an honor.